Hey, 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 welcome back. This video is going to be all about sending user operations with the AASDK. In previous videos, we went over VM. So if you don't already know the VM library, this video kind of assumes that you do. Uh, if you don't already know it, go check out the 60 minutes running through VM from uh, start to finish so that you could be able to understand what this library is. Because the AASDK, as you can see here, is built on top of VM. If you want to learn more about the AASDK, you can come out here to GitHub, Alchemy platform slash AASDK, which We'll provide this link down below uh, and then you could check it out here as well as going to the documentation on the account kit and check out like the qu quick start guide to be able to jump into the ASDK super quickly. Uh, right here I'm going to take a closer look at this library using it to send some user operations picking up from where we left off in that 60 minute speed run of the VM library. So let's go ahead and jump in. So what I have over here is a repository that's pretty similar to the one that we did in the VM speedrun. Um, in here, <coughs> for my dependencies, I have a .env, and then I also have VM in here. Uh, as well, I added AA Core and AA Alchemy, which are going to be two components of the AA SDK library. And then I have some dev dependencies here for TypeScript, which we're going to be using to compile and run our files. Awesome. So let's get underway. Uh, what I do have here from before, because uh, I don't want to rewrite all of this, is just a uh, file to deploy a contract. And our contract that we're going to be deploying is this example.soul, which I have not written any code in here, but I wanted to do that in front of you, so I saved this and put it as blank, and then we'll write some code in here. But I do have this script, which is going to help us compile this in a second. It's complaining right now because I don't have an artifact, for example.json. This is where we're going to be pulling out our ABI and our bytecode so that we can actually deploy this contract and interact with it. Then additionally, in my .env, I have a few things in here that are going to make it super easy for us to get started. I have a private key, which we're going to turn into an account. We're going to be using this as an externally owned account, so we can actually deploy this contract. And then I also have an API URL. Additionally, I also have a gas policy in there, and we'll see how we're going to use that when we send uh, user operations in just a moment. Uh, okay, great. So that's everything that we need in order to get started. You could see here from the previous example that we were creating a wallet client. We're going to be interacting with Arbitrum Sapolia and then interacting with our Alchemy API endpoint uh, behind the scenes using HTTP. And then we're going to be deploying our contract and getting that transaction receipt if it is successful. And we'll be able to get our contract address from that. Uh, if everything works out the way we expect it to. Great. So what we need to do now is we need to actually create something that's going to be our contract, and then we're going to interact with this contract using a user operation instead of using this account as an externally owned account as we are in this example here. So let's go ahead and get started. So for this contract here, I'm just going to do a really basic contract, super simple example, where we're going to have a public uint x, that is going to just be a uint 256 that starts at the value zero. And then I'm going to create a function called change x that is just going to modify x. And we will be passing in this so we can change x. And every time we change x, I just want to uh, emit an event. This is going to make it easier for us to, when we're looking at these user operations, be able to see everything that's occurring because if I batch all these user operations in one transaction, we want to be able to see all those state changes really easily from uh, Etherscan. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to create an event that's going to be called X changed and uh, we will go ahead and just pass in a uint there and then we'll say X changed and pass in underscore X uh, to be whatever it changed into there. Uh, so what, ooh, forgot my emit. That shows my age and solidity because I remember solidity before there was the emit keyword. Uh, okay, great. So that is our example there. So now if we want to be able to actually pull in the ABI and the bytecode like we have here in our deploy contract, I need to compile this, which I'm going to do with my global solidity compiler. So I already have in my memory of my terminal uh, the code, the command here that I could use, which is going to just compile out the ABI and the binaries for my example.sol. So I'll go ahead and run that. That's going to use my global Solidity compiler, like I mentioned, to create this JSON file that's going to have inside of it the ABI, 
which is just going to have the methods that we talked about, right? So it's going to have that event, the X change, that's so going to have a UN256. Then it's going to have my method change X, which is going to allow me to pass in an input to pass in some UN256 to be able to say, this is what I want to change X to. And then we have a view function to go look up what that X is uh, so we can go interact with it. Finally, we have the binaries, the bytecode that we're going to use to actually deploy this contract. Awesome. So that's everything that we need to do uh, to deploy this contract. So let's go ahead and deploy it. So that's going to be my next step is I'm going to go ahead and clear this out. I'm going to say npx ts node, and then we'll call this source deploy. And then hopefully this will work out where we can actually see this uh, being deployed to Arbitrum Sepolia, which is the chain that we're trying to send this to. Okay, great. So this looks like a valid transaction. Again, I'm logging out the transaction receipt here. So inside of the receipt, one thing that we might expect to see is this contract address, which is what I wanted here. I want a contract to be able to interact with so I can start sending some user oper operations to change X. All right, so that's what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and create um, a file here that we're just gonna call user ops .ts. And one thing I'm gonna pull over is the contract address. I want this because I'm going to be interacting with the same contract every time uh, when I send the user operations. That's the one thing that we're going to keep going here. Uh, but we are going to change up a few things from our deploy. That being said, I do want to pull over a lot of this. So let me pull over some of the imports just to make this super easy for myself. Uh, just so I don't have to redo the .env and the example.json, although there's a few things that I definitely will not be using, right? I'm not going to be using the binaries because I'm not going to need to redeploy this contract. Uh, I'm also not really going to be using much from VM here. We'll see if I need to import any of this stuff, uh, but the private key to account will not be useful because I'm going to be creating a local signer. Uh, that we're going to use with a, a client from the AASDK as opposed to a client from VM. Although it's important to note that the client that we're going to be using in a moment extends upon the VM client. So you could use it in the places that you would typically use a VM client. Uh, okay, great. So this is mostly what I wanted to pull over from before. Um, yeah, we're not going to need this private key to an account because we're going to create a local signer. The signer is going to be this local account signer, which comes from AA Core. So local account signer, what I can do is I can say uh, private key to account signer. And this is going to allow me, it's a similar method to what we were looking at with VM before, where we take a private key and turn it into account. But in this case, we're not turning it into account, we're turning it into a signer. And a signer in this instance is going to be something that we're signing something with. We're not necessarily treating it as an account, right? So in this case, with a signer, what we're actually doing with the signer is we have an address or we have a private key, right, that is signing a user operation. Then we send this over to a bundler, which is acting as a typical EOA. And inside of the bundler, it's going to take a bunch of user operations. So I'll have a user op, user op, and these are all going to be inside of a transaction. And then, of course, in ERC4337, uh, in ERC4337 style account abstraction, then this bundler submits this on chain to an entry point. The entry point sends this to a smart contract account, which sends it to our contract, which is what we're going to see in a moment. This is the contract where we're actually trying to change X at the end of the day. Uh, so this is everything that we need to do. I think I'm getting a bit of a, a TypeScript issue here, which I'm just going to make sure that we pass in a 0x there beforehand. Um, one thing that I do want to do, because in this case, I'm going to be passing in gas policy. So this entry point is also going to be interacting with a paymaster. Uh, and this paymaster is something that uh, we put up with, uh, with Alchemy through the gas manager. So you can actually interact with the gas manager to get your transaction paid for for you. So what that means is my private key doesn't actually need to be treated as an account. It doesn't need to hold on to its own gas. So in that case, what I can do is I could actually use any private key that I want to, as long as you know I keep it safe because this is gonna be the owner of my smart contract account, but this private key does not have to have any gas in front of it. So we could just generate a new random private key. And just to prove that to you, I'll just generate a new private key every time we run this script. So I'm gonna require a, a core Node.js library called Crypto, where I can say random bytes and grab 32 random bytes, which is gonna be, uh, um, a private key size and then we can go ahead and say two string hex and this is going to go ahead and return me 32 random bytes which is a valid private key and then we could use that for our local account signer 
Um, so in this case, because it doesn't need to spend any gas, this could just be random 32 bytes, which I'll show you in a moment is going to work perfectly fine for our user operations, right? Because this is a totally gas-free, at least from our perspective, gas-free operation. Okay, great. So we have our contract address, we have our signer. Now it's time to actually get into the core of this, which is where we are going to be sending the user operations. So let's get that started. So similar to... When we were using VM in the previous example, we want to create a client. That's going to be the first thing that we're going to want to create. Now, AASDK gives you access to several different clients depending on uh, what you are using the client for. In this particular case, we want to create a, an account client that allows us access to an ERC6900 modular account. So this is going to be a modular account client. So what we're going to call this is we're going to say await create modular account alchemy client. And now you can check out the documentation like I linked before with the account kit documentation to see all the latest uh, parameters that you need to pass through. As you can see in my package JSON, when I uh, ran this library, I was at uh, this version of AA alchemy and AA core. Uh, so at this point in time, the parameters that I need to pass in for the uh, alchemy client are going to be API key. And so for the API key, I already have this inside of my process.env and I'm going to promise TypeScript that it's already in there by putting that exclamation mark up. Uh, the other thing I need to pass in is Arbitrum Sepolia. And this is pretty similar to when we uh, go to do this with, with, um, with the VM client. The one big difference thing that we need to do is instead of importing this from VM chains, in this case, we also need the definition from AA core. Uh, which is going to be a little bit different in that it's going to specify some important properties for our uh, Alchemy client when interacting with the bundler. So you need to be careful about importing this chain definition from AA core. So that's what we really want to do. And if you saw here, it gave me a couple different options. So you can see it's given me Arbitrum Sepolia. Uh, this is the first one. And then the second one here is actually going to import this from... Uh, AA core and now you can see it's actually pulling it from a core up there so that's actually working properly great so that's my uh, my chain and then for my signer I already have my signer here so that's what I'm going to pass in the final thing that I'm going to pass in here and this is optional but in most cases when you're using account abstraction you want to sponsor the gas that's that's for the majority of account abstraction cases that's going to be something that people will want but there's a number of different features that you would want with account abstraction so if you were going to sponsor your users gas uh, which we are going to do in this case, you would also specify a uh, gas manager config. And inside of there, we would pass in a policy ID, which again, I also have inside of my .env, which is called policy ID. And again, I'm going to promise TypeScript that it's there. And hopefully this will get pulled in with my .env. Okay, great. There's our client. Similar to our VM client, this is going to give us a few methods. Uh, one of the methods, it's going to give us uh, some of the public methods that we're used to on our VM client. So things like get transaction receipt is going to be really useful for us in a moment uh, because I'm going to get a transaction and then I'm going to want to get the receipt. Uh, all these other things that you might see on a, a VM client. But more importantly for us, we also want to get the method to be able to send a user operation, which is used, uh, which is actually called send user operation. So that's what we want to do is we want to get this send uh, user operation, which is now defined on my client. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and send that through. What this is going to do is it's going to take a property called UO, and this property will allow us to pass in a user operation or a list of user operations, an array of user operations, if we want to batch them together, which we will in a moment. For now, I'm just going to send through one user operation so we can see a simple example of this first, but in a moment, we'll send through several user operations. So what we can do with the user operation is we could target a specific contract, and then we could pass in some data. Uh, this is what we're going to do is our contract that we already deployed. We're going to target it. And for our data, we are going to try to change X to like 48, right? Something like that. Now, this is not going to work, right? This is not data. We need to actually encode uh, function data. We need to encode call data to be able to target this contract at this method with this parameter here. So to do that, we need to do this in a sort of manual fashion, which is using the encode function 
data from VM here. So what we could do is we could say our call data is going to be encode function data. And this is going to take a few parameters. Namely, it's going to take the ABI, which we have uh, because we pull that in from example over here. So there's our ABI coming in. And then we're going to take a function name, which is going to be the function that we're targeting. In this case, it's going to be changeX. And then we're going to take in some args. And our args in this case is going to be the 48, which is what we want to pass into our uh, contract address to change it to 48. So it should start out as zero. Right now, that's what it should be. And then we should be changing it to 48. So we'll go ahead and pass that in. And if that's all working properly, we should be able to test this out. Now, what we want to do with the send user operation is this is going to return a result. Not necessarily that the operation has gone through, not necessarily that the transaction has gone through and is on chain, but a result that we can then use to go look up the transaction hash and then make sure that that transaction is actually working properly. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say uh, transaction. We're going to go ahead and get the transaction hash from a method called client dot get transaction get. I believe it's get user. Oh no, sorry, it's wait for user operation transaction. And with this, what we could do is we could pass in our result here from our send user operation. So this is going to passing in a user operation result from the send user operation method, we can actually get back our transaction hash. And if this is working properly, uh, and the transaction hash comes through, then we could assume that this was um, this was put on chain. And now we know that this is actually changing something. Our call data has been put on chain. Our method has been changed and the value should be 48. Now what we can do at this point is we can actually go look up the value, which would be helpful here to make sure that it was actually changed to 48. So we could say X is going to be await client.read contract. And this is one of those methods that we get from VM that we talked about in the VM speed run, where we could say read contract and we could pass in ABI. And then we could pass in the address of the contract address. And then we could also uh, pass in the function that we're trying to uh, read, which is going to be X. So this should get us back the value for X, which at this point we expect to be that value that I passed in uh, just a moment ago. So we should see that it changes to 48 here. So let's go ahead and try to run this and see if indeed we have been able to change this. So I'm going to clear this out and we'll go ahead and run NPX ts node source slash user operations and we'll go ahead and pass that in so let's see if this is working properly uh, we'll give it a moment usually pretty quick on arbitrum sepolia there we go so there's our transaction hash and there's our new value for x uh, we could probably see some of this stuff if we pass this in over here to uh, Sepolium Arbor Scan. So if we pass this in here, we can go take a look at the transaction. There's a bunch of logs over here. So uh, a lot of these logs you're going to see, this is the first time that we're using this private key, right? Because this private key is being generated here. So this private key is mapped to its own unique smart contract address on chain. So this new smart contract address is now being deployed. So you're going to see a lot of new things like Modular account has been initialized. That's our ERC 6900 account. Uh, the account has been deployed. You're going to see things like there was a plugin installed. This is going to be the multi owner plugin, and we're going to update it so that there's only one plugin or one owner. This is going to be the owner that we specified as the signer. So we have that signer that is signing the user operation, and that, that signer specifically is allowed to run operations against this smart contract. And then uh, you could see this upgraded event here as well. We should also see a modified X here or change X. Uh, so this is probably the change X right here. We, we made it so that, um, so for one thing that contract is not, the source code is not verified. So we're seeing here on ArborScan, uh, just the topic which would be the name of the, the function typically, right? If we actually uh, have the source code out on ArborScan. But in this case, we don't actually have the source code out there. So right now it's just showing me the topic at, in its raw form. But if this is working, then this number should be the same one as we passed in, which is that 48. So this is what we're gonna see here. I think it's pretty lucky that we got four E's on the topic. That's pretty cool. Uh, so, the, and it's kind of like we're seeing the topic, C, which is kind of neat. So 
this will be really helpful because now what I want to do is I want to actually send through a whole bunch of user operations. I want to batch them together and then we'll be able to see all these events on chain. We'll be able to see a bunch of user operations actually inside of one transaction, which is another benefit that you get from account abstraction is being able to batch a bunch of user operations together inside of one transaction. The bundler, again, takes in user operations from many different users who are signing those user operations with the signer, and then the bundler is gonna put them together in one transaction, put that on chain, and then the entry point can cycle through all of those different user operations actually executing them and paying back the bundler for the gas that was spent for those uh, user operations. Great, so let's actually see that happen here. Let's actually see multiple user operations go through one transaction. So let's come back here into my user ops. And uh, what I'm gonna do is instead of doing just one user operation here, I'm gonna turn this into an array of user operations. So let's do that. This is gonna look a little funky here for a minute, but I'm gonna say UOs. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna do like, I don't know, a bunch of numbers. And I, I, for each one of these numbers, I'm gonna encode a user operation that we're actually gonna send on chain. So we're actually gonna be batching seven user operations here to change X from 48 to one to two to three to four to five to six to seven. And we should see all of that inside of one transaction. So I'm gonna map this to a bunch of UOs. So we got X and what we're going to return here is gonna be a UO for each one of these. So the target is going to be a contract address, just like we had down here for the UO. And then the data is going to be this encode function data, but with a different value each time, right? So instead of 48 here, we're gonna pass in X. So that way we are uh, changing it from one to two to three to four to five to six to seven. And then we would pass this in as, not the data, sorry, as the UOs instead of one UO. And it's giving me a TypeScript error, which looks like it's just not expecting my target to be zero. Okay, so I just gotta make sure that this contract address here is zero X um, initialized. So we'll just, we'll say that this is going to be hex and then that should go away there. Uh, cool, okay. So now the TypeScript error is gone because we are asserting that indeed this is a hex string, the contract address that's being passed through. Uh, and then we'll get that result back and um, yeah, hopefully. So at the end of this, I wonder if you could think about this. We're sending in a, a transaction at the end of the day. The bundler is going to bundle all these user operations through. What do we expect the value of X to be at the end of all these user operations? Well, if they execute an order, which is what we're expecting here, then we should end up with seven at the end of this. So X should be seven here at the end. Uh, but then we'll go take a look at the transaction hash to see did it change from 48 to one to two to three to four to five to six to seven like we expected and make sure that all of those events are inside of that one transaction. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So let's send our user operations through. If this is successful, we should see a transaction hash and then the number seven, right? So let's see if we see that. And there we go. All right, awesome. So there's our seven. I'm gonna take this transaction hash over here. I'm gonna put it into this and we'll take a look at the logs. So we're seeing a lot of the same logs. Again, this is a new private key. So we are deploying a new smart contract address, a new smart contract account again. So you're gonna see all of those events for installing a plugin, for initializing the modular account, of deploying the modular account. Uh, but then we see that C event, which is going to be the one that's actually the, the change X, X was changed. Uh, so what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to um, take a look at these different numbers here. And it does look like we made this uh, event be whatever X is being changed to. Should we? So for the first event, we should expect it to be one. And then the second event, it should be two, three, and then four, five, six, and seven. So what does this mean? This means that we had one transaction, right? Because we're looking at the view of a transaction. This is one transaction. And inside of this transaction, we created a new smart contract account, but we also bundled a whole bunch of user operations together. So the entry point is actually going through each one of the user operations. Many user operations are being sent through and it's executing them one at a time, paying back the bundler uh, for each user operation. So this user operation changed the state from zero to one or 48 to one. This one changed it from one to two. This one changed it from two to three. So this is kind of a silly example of something that you would batch 
Uh, you, it doesn't really make sense to do that in this case, but you can imagine uh, some examples where it would make sense to do that. And oftentimes they could be user operations that are completely unrelated coming from many different users, in which case you could take all of those user operations, batch them, put them on chain. Uh, and that is another benefit that we are getting from account abstraction there. So super cool to see this working. Uh, that is how you send user operations using the AA SDK. So we'll be diving into more stuff on the AA SDK soon, and I hope you enjoyed this video.